Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Festival of Ideas Online. I'm Andrew Kelly, and I'm Director of Festival of Ideas. We're honoured today to have again with us novelist, commentator and writer, Ejay Tamilkaran, live to discuss the future of democracy. This is a first part in a series of events we're running this autumn, into this autumn, on the future of democracy. And more events are listed in the chat and on our website. Ejé was in Bristol last year for the publication of her essential book, How to Lose a Country, The Seven Steps from Dictatorship to Democracy. Uh, she was also writer in residence for our Festival of the Future City last November. Thank you very much, Ejé, for joining us. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Andrew, for having me. It's so nice to be with you. Um, I don't see you right now. Maybe it's me, but just know that I don't see you. I hear you, but I don't see you. OK, we'll let one of the teams sort that out. But as long as you can hear me and I can pose questions to you, uh, that's good. Um, for the audience, if you wish to put questions uh, for this event, there's a question. You can you see the ask a question box uh, at the bottom of the screen. So please put in all the questions you can and we'll weave those into the discussion uh, as we go through. We'll also put this recording online uh, when it's finished and we'll publish a transcript in about a week's time. AJ, today is a reminder that the march of the populists continues um, with what's happened in Poland. What's your immediate reaction to, to this? And we're still finding out what's going on, of course. Um, well, Duda seems to be winning. Uh, I think it, the election results are official or not yet. I'm not sure, but, uh, you know, it was obvious that he's winning. Um, well, Poland has been in in deep trouble since, you know, 11, 10 or something, you know, around that time. I was there in 2016 uh, for the publication of Turkey, the Insane and the Melancholy, and people were um, already uh, very alarmed and they were terrified. And I think it all came true. It, it, they are now in the last phase of losing their democracy, it seems. So let's talk a little bit about the book and we'll, we'll come back to Poland later. But let's talk a little bit about the book. Now, you, you talked about the seven steps mm -hmm. um, from dictatorship to democracy. Could you just take us through those steps? Because um, um, and, and, you know, when, because I think that would be helpful for the discussion we're going to have. Exactly. Um, how to lose a country, the seven seven steps from democracy to dictatorship uh, starts with an introduction and I think this is important because uh, it, uh, the introduction tells the story why I wrote the book. Uh, in 2016 I was in uh, London giving a speech about my previous book Turkey, The Insane and Melancholy and people were listening to me as if they're listening to a listening uh, irrelevant story and I was trying to tell them that these things will happen to them as well it is coming towards Europe this right-wing populism or rising authoritarianism uh, and I wasn't taken very seriously I think <laughs> by, the, by then so there was this woman in the audience it was in a frontline club um, in London um, after I told about Turkey, she brought her hands together in a very emotional tone. She asked me, so what can we do for you? And I answered back, no, 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 what can I do for you? Because you are in the beginning of this process, whereas we almost completed the pro pro process in Turkey. So actually, I have the experience and you're just starting, you're just a novice in this right-wing populism, which is going to hit you very hard very soon. So... The introduction, that's why the introduction is called, what can I do for you? Um, so, and then there are the seven steps from, the, uh, from democracy to dictatorship. The first step is uh, create a movement. Uh, and maybe it's better to say that I wrote the book as a manual to a dictator. For a beginner dictator, it's a manual for how to build a dictatorship. So it is the first step he has to take is to create a movement. As we all know, uh, representative democracy is going through a crisis, and this has started already in 1980s, evolved in 1990s, and now we're in the 21st century, and representative is not holding water anymore. We hear the creaking sounds of a sinking ship, so to speak. 
not, not only in terms of national democracies, but also in terms of global organizations like United Nations or European Union or NATO even. Uh, so in this, um, in this em political environment where uh, the old is almost dead, but the new is not born yet, uh, the idea of creating a movement sounds really promising, as opposed to party, a static, um, you know, concept. Movement promises, you know, action and also a change in the system, and that is why it it is very appealing to people, but mostly to the people in the provinces. And this, this, these movements in every country starts. Uh, from the provinces and they rise uh, to be visible in the big cities. Um, this is the first step, creating a movement. But also, while creating a movement by that political energy, uh, rising right-wing populism creates the illusion of giving uh, meaning to people's lives, a greater ideal part of a greater entity and so on. So creating a movement and creating a meaning is the first step, uh, creating a cause uh, actually, is the first step of right-wing populism. The second uh, step is quite annoying and entertaining at the same time. We all feel that we cannot have a proper discussion, proper, proper conversation with the supporters of right-wing populist leaders. And I, uh, I wanted to reveal the logical reason uh, why we cannot have that conversation in the second step, disrupt rationale and terrorize the language. Right-wing populism uses a certain narrative and a certain schizophrenic logic to terrorize uh, the communication sphere. They are doing this in physical life and they are mostly doing it on social media. So if anyone listening to this, you know, event, uh, asking themselves, why cannot, uh, why cannot I pass my message through the, to these people? I think they have to read the chapter to see that even Aristo would fail to communicate with these guys with the basic rules of Aristo logic, Aristotelian logic. So the third step is, which I find most important in the book, is remove the shame. Immorality is hot in the post-truth world. In this third step, shamelessness and ruthlessness become uh, political tools, very effective political tools, also badge of honor for these politicians and for supporters of these politicians. As we know, we do not only live by written laws, we uh, live by traditions, common values, basic consensuses, and so on. These, pol these leaders and their supporters are attacking these basic consensuses, uh, human values and traditions so ruthlessly that they leave their audiences, uh, their opposition, uh, almost uh, paralyzed in shock. Uh, and they start using shamelessness is a, a cultural identity and then political identity. So they become kind of prideful with their shamelessness. And I think it, this would sign fami uh, sound familiar for British people at the moment after Cummings uh, did what he did, or it, it will sound equally familiar to you know, uh, people living in the United States after you know, having lived with Trump, Trump all these time, all these, all these years. So I do think that shamelessness and post-truth has a connection because all these lies could not, be, could not have been produced and could not have been told to the masses unless uh, shame was still there. When I speak of shame, I do not speak of shame in terms of uh, oppressive tool on people's individual lives but as a form of shame that makes us humble and more humane. Uh, but these uh, political leaders and their supporters do not recognize this uh, basic human value. And this makes them um, 
it, this enables them to tell all the lies that they need to tell. So post-truth and shame, the idea of shame, or lack of shame rather, uh, has a deep and strong connection. And it all goes back to 1980s. It's very much in detail in the book, so I'm not getting into detail. But it's also related to our understand, our changing understanding of human being and how neoliberalism defined human being and how that definition enabled this human being to be shameless today after decades of hardcore, greedy capitalism, only capitalism. So we, I am going on to the fourth step, uh, which is very important to, for today's Poland, actually. It is dismantle the judicial and political mechanisms. Uh, every right-wing populist leader does this. Trump did it, Boris Johnson did it. Every other leader you can think of today as, you know, as the symbols of, as those who we see as the symbols of right-wing populism, they did the same thing. They did not only uh, feel uh, the judicial and political uh, positions with their own people, with their own supporters, but also they played with the uh, institutions, the state institutions, uh, the societal institutions, uh, so that uh, you know they became like uh, they became they started to look like paper tigers. I don't know if you remember, but Trump, as soon as he came to power, he started to meddle with FBI and CIA. And it was as if we, the rest of the world was watching it, thinking, oh, we thought these guys were really strong. I can see that Trump can play with these guys. So actually, it is uh, what they do is creating, creating a sense of superfluousness uh, for uh, the op uh, for the audience, um, they create this super. They create this image of superfluous state, uh, meaningless, weak, and inconsequential state. So after doing that, uh, it becomes so easy uh, to to you know the rest of the in rest of the institutions for them. And the fifth step is design your own citizen. Uh, when a country comes to this step, it's almost already too late. Um, you know, the regime, now it's established. I mean, like it invaded all and judicial mechanism and so on. And now uh, it starts to mold its own ideal citizen. And those who are not resembling to this ideal citizen, are not citizens anymore. They're second class, class citizens, and they might be subjected to uh, wartime rules, sort of. They are treated <coughs> as the enemy. And when, it, in terms of designing the citizen, uh, the ideal citizen, uh, women take the most important part in this process, uh, because somehow all the right wing populist leaders think that women uh, are like mushy uh, material that can be remolded and shaped overnight. So when a regime starts to meddle with women, uh, people have to be alert because it is the ultimate sign uh, that fascism is very close uh, to that country. And six one, this one is quite important for Britain, I think, uh, and also for United States. Uh, the sixth step is let them laugh at the horror. As we know that, you know, when it comes to right-wing populist leaders, uh, we use, as opposition, we use political humor uh, to bring them down, to, you know, damage their image, uh, to weaken their political strength and so on. But then this political humor, by time, becomes an addiction, sort of. And it becomes a too comfortable shelter to go out from to face the reality. And then also it creates the illusion that while we are joking about these leaders or their supporters, uh, we are feeling as if we are, uh, you know, doing something political. We think that expressing our anger or mocking them 
is a political action, which is not. It is completely inconsequential. So laughing is something that we have to be careful about. We have to be careful about where we laugh, how we laugh, to whom we laugh, and what it makes to them uh, is less important, actually, what it makes to us. Uh, so uh, yeah, this is the sixth step. Seventh, th seventh step, and this is the last one, build your own country. It is the phase where, uh, well, it is the phase where love it or leave it comes to scene. And um, you don't have to lose a country. Uh, in, well, you don't have to uh, be forced to leave the country to lose a country. You can live in your country and still feel like a refugee, still feel like you have to hide from something. And then you understand that you are not feeling at home anymore in your own country. And that is the phase, I think, the seventh step, where you really feel like you lose your country, you lost your country. So these are the steps. I don't know if it's not depressing enough, I can go on actually. Well, I was, I was going to depress us a bit more, to be honest, because um, this was published in February 2019 in the UK anyway. It's been translated into around 10 other languages, I think, so far. So it's obviously having quite an impact. And when I was preparing today, I, I wrote a list out of some of the things that have happened since. Now, of course, we're all aware of what's happened since. But when you put it in a list like that, it does become quite depressing, you know. So you had Bolsonaro and Brazil, Poland we've talked about. You had the general election victory here with a really huge conservative majority. Putin extending his rule to 2036. Netanyahu clinging on to power. Chinese presidency term limits extended to 2035. What's happening right now in Hong Kong with the Chinese? Um, Orban's power grab and what's happened in Turkey? And then the, the biggest fear of all, which seems to be coming forward now, is the, the, the November elections in the United States and ideas that, you know, whether the election might be stolen in some form or indeed whether President Trump, if he's not elected, will be you know, refuse to leave the White House. I mean, all of this really demonstrates individual steps, isn't it, that, that you've talked about in terms of, of that work. Um, so, um, but, but where do you think, tell us, a little, give us a little bit about your thoughts on, on for example, the, the way that these populist leaders are really embedding themselves now through legislative and judicial processes like Putin and like the, China, uh, the Chinese Premier. Um, I wrote the book in 2018, it was published in 2019, and I had the first book event, uh, and I, it was in February, and I remember people still thinking that Brexit wouldn't happen, and they, when I told them, well, you will have Boris Johnson as Prime Minister, get ready for that, they were, they were laughing. I am not a, you know, prophet, I am not a... Like, I don't know, astrologist or something. It is just, I see the pattern and, you know, after seeing the pattern, it is almost impossible not to predict what's to come. And it is, it's not a pattern that I invented, so to, so to speak. I, I just observed it. Uh, but then while observing it, of course, I, ha I have a ideological perspective. I, I have a political science perspective and so on. And I know that uh, it is not all of a sudden in every country, individual leaders decided to act as they act today. There is a logic behind this and it, go, it all goes back to what we have done since 1980s. Uh, if we see this as, you know, if we see this, I, I, I don't like this word, as a big picture, uh, we can see that there is a mechanism behind it. And the mechanism, is about uh, a very fundamental contradiction. The contradiction is uh, the contract of democracy is not compatible with the contract of capitalism or the current, uh, you know, uh, current uh, situation of capitalism. Um, so this contradiction creates a danger. Either this entire system will fall down or some people 
uh, will come together and try to save it. And I see all these guys, all the, you know, leaders, all these leaders that you have been talking about, as the last mercenaries of a, you know, failing system. So they are trying to defend the system. They are not interested in democracy at all. They are interested in uh, the economic system working properly and they are trying to protect the privileged. Uh, so it is, you know, I, I see it as something like, you know, you, you remember uh, it was a, a monumental symbolic film in 1980s, Rocky Balboa and Mondragon on the other side as Soviet Union boxer. Now there's another ring, you know, that ring is over. Now there's another ring and on this ring, uh, on the on one side there are these last mercenaries strong leaders of um you know right-wing populism that are there to uh, defend the last holding castle of capitalism and on the other side we the people this is how it is actually and it became quite clear during the times of corona i think that they do not care about people but they care about the privileged and the economic cycle the economic mechan mechanism which is not just at all uh in terms of united states and in terms of other countries um as there is a pattern in how these leaders behave there is also a pattern for opposition as well and in how to lose a country i try to explain that in order to actually warn the united states and other european countries um the there is, um, you know, the established opposition in each country does the same thing, and it's so desperate. Uh, they want, they ha, uh, they fee, they find themselves in a contradictory position. They both have to protect the establishment, the political establishment, but they also have to do the opposition uh, duties, and this is. You know, this is a mismatch. It cannot go together. That is why they are so confused. And today in the United States, we see that this is happening. Thanks to Corona and thanks to Black Lives Matter and thanks to Trump being so obvious a clown, uh, Joe Biden's job is so easy. But then in general, uh, in fundamental logic, what they are doing is, uh, is not really, cannot work because you cannot uh, protect the establishment as it is, political as establishment as it is, and meanwhile be the opposition. And, you know, in terms of right-wing populism and in terms of uh, anxiety that it creates, there are, two fun there, are, there are two fundamental reactions. There are people like me who think that, okay, there is something wrong with capitalism. That is why we're having this, because if there was social justice, there could have been better democracy, but if we cannot establish social justice, we cannot have democracy. And there are the other people who think that there will be back to normal if we get rid of these leaders only. If we get rid of Trump, if we get rid of Boris Johnson, oh, everything will be back to normal. No, it won't be back to normal. One, there are millions of people who are religiously devoted to these leaders. Second, there is a systemic problem that we have to handle. And when I look at opposition, uh, very much in general, I, I see them split into two. There is the established opposition, you know, conventional uh, progressive parties uh, that are trying to keep the establishment together. Uh, and meanwhile, they are aware that there is a real danger of fascism. And there are the, you know, uh, new uh, progressive politics uh, swarming around the establishment. They do not want to be part of the establishment. So it's like, you know, um, the effort to make the world better is as if split into two. One is in establishment and one outside of it. And we, our job is now to find a way to bring them together, uh, to be more, to give a more example. I mean, like our job in United States is United States is to find a way how Black Lives Matter movement comes together, integrates uh, its political energy to Democratic Party, for instance, to give an example. Uh, that's one of the 
optimistic sides and and there's been a specific question about that that I want to come back to but just I just wanted to bring in a couple of audience questions while we're on this area one of them is about the the the, the position in Poland but also Remain in Hungary and Turkey about mm-hmm. the attacks on um LGBTIQ rights mm-hmm. and and women's rights and how how significant are these in terms of, of rising populism and rising authoritarianism? Misogyny is the wingman of fascism, period. Um, so if we see misogyny, we should expect fascism very soon. By the way, uh, I wrote the book in, 19, in 2018, published 2019. Now we're 2020. Now I am reconsidering uh, the, you know, which concept to use: rising right-wing populism, or are we already in that phase that we can freely fascism? Because when I published the book, especially in Germany, it was an issue. I mean, like whether to call it fascism or not. But I think it is now time we call it by its name: it's fascism. Um, so. Uh, LGBTQ, uh, LGBTQ uh, t- transgender people, uh, that minority is very fragile and vulnerable. Uh, women are also like that. Everybody has to know that this is only the beginning. If they get those people, women and the minority, uh, you know, transgender minority, uh, gay, lesbian minority, they'll get to the others as well. It is so, you know, it is almost like a joke uh, to me now to say this, but you know, it's, it sounds like a joke, but it is actually not. I remember uh, uh, first three people who were uh, sacked from newspapers in Turkey from, uh, you know, mainstream media uh, were women. One of them was me in Turkey. But when it comes to women, uh, I think everybody is a little bit relaxed uh, when they are victimized. Uh, it's as if the old status quo is trying to uh, make a deal with the new status quo, and in order to do it, they are giving away riches, uh, which is fine for them as well. Uh, but then it, it's always too late when they when they realize that they shouldn't have given the riches in the first first place because that oppression that violence come to their doors as well uh, as long as they are not religious devotees of the regime so if in poland today people uh, do not protect uh, these minorities and women they can be sure that it's going to come to them even though they will pretend that they are following the rules of the regime I am. I slightly lost you then, but let's move on to another question, because one thing that I, one of the differences in the reaction to the pandemic, for example, by leaders, it seems to be that women leaders are performing far more better than, than male leaders. And perhaps that's a, a lesson for us as well, really. Yeah, we are. I am kind of proud of it. Uh, well, I'm like, this is a bit uh, risky to talk about, but, you know, as a system breaks down, there, you know, when the system breaks down, there is a uh, crisis of malehood as well. This is uh, this goes for today. This goes for any other system that cracked down in the in the past. So whenever there is crisis of malehood, there is a vacuum in history, and that vacuum is always filled by women. And uh, I mean, like the, the most recent example would be Second World War Europe. Uh, women were all over the place because their a system was breaking down, uh, especially before First World War. As well, that is that was the case. So there is a, a political vacuum, and women are filling it now. Hopefully, they are this time. Uh, they will be there this time to stay. I am really hoping that. One thing it's also come up as a question. One thing, one question I wanted to ask you was how you, we tend to lump everything together in, in these kind of things and it's easy to do in half an hour's discussion and so on but you know at least in you know the position in Britain where you've got 
Boris Johnson as prime minister, you know, there will be a general election and he could be voted out. Um, compared to, say, China and Russia, um, you know, it's often difficult to vote those leaders out. And um, how how easy it, is it to draw those, tra- you know, transferable lessons across each? Or do we have to look at each case on its own? Of course. I mean, like, I cannot know Britain as a British uh, journalist or commentator or political analyst could. But then um, I didn't write this book to moan about my country, to, you know, to complain about my own situation. Actually, I really wrote it to help the other people here. And also, um, I believe that there should be a global solidarity in order to overcome this uh, crisis of democracy. Uh, I do not think that uh, we can beat fascism in one country it cannot be beaten in one country and then we can forget the other countries. It's not like that. And we have to rethink fascism again globally. And we have to ask ourselves, did we really beat fascism in the Second World War? Or we just, you know, uh, beat Hitler and then uh, we carried on uh, with business as usual. So I think this is a good time to think about that question. Uh, and I, I really do believe that uh, uh, beating fascism cannot be shouldered. It's too heavy to be shouldered by uh, citizens of one country. It is so maddening, so devastating, and so exhausting uh, that uh, that once it takes over fascism, uh, people are already dead tired so we cannot expect from citizens of a country to to be fascism on their own we have to help each other and it would be really kind of naive not to because we see that all these guys actually quite buddies i mean like they are really in, they're in close touch with each other they are cooperating uh, although they look like they're fighting sometimes they are actually uh, very well collaborating with each other. So why don't we do that as, well as the opposition? I've been reminded in the chat that um, your book is also very optimistic in certain areas and that there are ways we can move forward. I mean, what what sources of optimism? Well, so happy to and I say this in the, sorry. <laughs> I, I say this in the context that we this is a theme we're running right through the autumn in how do we rescue, strengthen democracy. And, um, and one, of the, um, one of the things we, one of our speakers recently, Margaret Heffernan, talked about cathedral projects and the need to you know, plan things in the very long term. And one of those, she said, was about the recovery of democracy. So what, what hopeful signs do you see? And, and, and also, you're, you're part of a new movement, aren't you, which is on the uh, left yeah. across Europe? Mm-hmm. It is a uh, new progressive international. I'm in the advisory board with other 50 members around the world. Um, and uh, if everything goes right, we're going to have our first meeting in Iceland, actually, in September. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that as well. It's going to be an exciting time for uh, global left, I think. Um, the, you know, we, we see a lot of things that, are, that ha- would have been incredible uh, one week prior to they ha- one week before they happened, they would, they would sound fanta- fantastical, like Black Lives Matter. Uh, you know, made the Minneapolis city government uh, disband the police force. This is this could have been, you know, a crazy idea one week before that. Uh, but now we are living in the age of incredible, so to speak. Um, but the most hopeful, hopeful, like a new op- you know, new possibility. Where I see new possibility is the local governments. Because we have seen during Corona uh, that the, uh, certain uh, cities like New York, London, Istanbul, they have become unprecedentedly uh, rebellious against the power which has been seized by right-wing populism. And people 
citizens of that city gathered around these local governments and they own these governments, own these local political powers uh, like they have never done before. So I think new politics, uh, the, the new dynamics of politics in coming decades uh, will be established upon uh, this tension between local governments and central governments that have been seized by right-wing populism. And it's going to be very exciting. Uh, I was in Porto Alegre in 2002 uh, for the World F Social Forum. Uh, the entire global um, opposition was there. It was a carnivalesque uh, giant meeting. And the reason it was held in Porto Alegre was that uh, the city was trying a new experiment, a new model. A city assembly, citizen assemblies, together with municipality um, institution. At the time, I think the opposition was quite confident. Uh, it was 2002. Uh, it was only one year to uh, taste our biggest defeat that was stop the war coalition, which couldn't stop the war in Iraq. Since then, I think, uh, one, uh, the global opposition uh, gathered experience it matured and also now in the dusk of authoritarianism uh, they feel the need to incorporate their political energy to the existing uh, political establishment somehow to beat the rising danger of fascism and this could only be done through it seems to me through local uh, local po local politics and finally, local politics are looking sexy enough to attract the new opposition, I think. We're almost out of time. I just want to ask you two specific questions which, which um, have come up in the discussion. First of all, how to lose a country still isn't published in Turkish. Is that right? No, it is not. Uh, you know, uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, yeah. But then all these things, uh, are the things that I have been writing for the last, at least last 10 years in Turkey. I had a column before I was fired, uh, and these are the things that I have been talking about, some of them at least. It is, it is not a nice thing to say that the book is not published in my mother tongue. It is a little bit painful, but in order to publish the book, you have to put a lot of people uh, in trouble, and I don't want to do that. Uh, the, the final question is, uh, is you, you say you're not a prophet, but you've been remarkably successful at some of the things <laughs> you prophesized. And there's been one question particularly about wh where do you think the UK might be in 10 years time, say? And, and th th that's perhaps an unfair question in, in the sense it's difficult to, to you know, we, we can't forecast what the economy is going to be like next week at the moment, <laughs> let alone where we'll be in 10 years time. But um, but in terms of, of are you optimistic that we can turn this 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 around and, and course, really make change happen? I am not either optimistic or pessimistic, but what I see is that you know this um, things will be happening. Interesting times are not good for normal people, but they are amazing times for storytellers like me. So I am kind of excited when I see that a new politics is shaping and it is becoming quite efficient uh, and it is becoming more visible, relevant and realistic as well. Uh, in 10 years time, Britain, uh, I cannot answer that question, but then I should say something for Britain. Don't think that Britain is... Um, don't think that all those centuries old pillars would hold anything. The institutions are people and people can be carried away um, by the zeitgeist. They can uh, devote themselves to power. So don't trust uh, your old institutions. That's what I would say to British people at this point. Well, that's good advice. Thank you very much for that. Um, we're out of time, I'm afraid. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all the questions, but we'll, this debate will go on. Um, we have a, a number of events coming up, as I mentioned, on the future of democracy. 
Um, this includes uh, from our own Bristol MPs, where this will be one of the issues, as well as later on this month with Anne Applebaum and with Masha Gesson. Um, and you can see details of these online uh, on our website, and they're also in the chat, so do uh, sign up for those as well. Um, our next event is next Monday with Jenny Kleeman, the, the uh, broadcaster, on her new book about sex robots and vegan meat. So a slightly different subject than what we've been talking <laughs> about today. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Andrew. Most of all, though, if you'd like to read Ejay's book, um, you can get it from our partners at Waterstones. Please do, um, do do that. And you're actually going to a physical bookshop now as well, in this country at least. So do that. But don't forget to wear your mask. Um, <laughs> thank you very much for participating. Thank you, Andrew. But thank you most of all to Ejay Temelkran. Thank you very much, Ejay. Thank you for having me.